You're the, man you're the manager for a small store. You hired one of your friends and you just found out that he's been stealing from the register, stealing stock, abandoning his post to visit with his girlfriend in the back room while he's the only one on duty. And the argument you had with him at the office just didn't settle it for you. You pound on his door. When he opens up, he goes pale, soils himself, and staggers back, gasping for breath. It doesn't impress you, really. You figure he just thinks you're showing up with the cops, until you step through his door and glance to the side, where you get a good look at yourself in the mirror. Or, at least, the parts of you that are still recognizable after that shotgun blast that your friend gave you at the end of that argument. In a small fisherman's village in the country of Bulgaria, on the dawn of January the 1st, everyone closes their curtains and holds their breath for half a minute. Hours after the craze of midnight celebrations, children look questioning at their parents worried, but cannot help to shiver in the embrace of their shaking parents. One can hear the bell being struck exactly 25 times last year in this short time span. The nearest church, however, is over 32 miles away. You will find no one out on the streets in these faithful 30 seconds, and even the birds will stop whistling. Some have gone out of their houses, roaring boldly in disbelief of this century-old tradition. On the first sunset of this year, two people gambled their fate in the very first rays of sunlight. The next dawn, the bell will be struck 27 times. A deja vu is actually a glitch in reality, and it indicates that something has just been changed. Someone or something has ceased to exist. All memories and records of their existence erased forever. A deja vu happens when they get into your brain, when they need to change your memories, Maybe to erase your brother from the world. You know, the brother that you never had. In almost every building, there is one corner, one small enclosure that no one ever looks at. It's the corner in the basement that has been blocked by a disused sofa for years. The thin space in the attic between the wall and the stacks and stacks of crates full of junk you never use, but can never throw away. The space that never sees the light of day, or any other kind of light at all. Where darkness does not merely dominate, but practically oozes out from around the edges of its prison. No one knows quite how long a space must remain concealed for it to acquire this particular property, nor if there is any specific condition it must meet. But it is a far more common occurrence than you might think. In newer buildings, when this happens, the residents often report feeling cold when passing by, even in attics during the hottest of summers. Whenever contemplating taking a quick peek to see if there is anything actually there, an unnatural dread seizes them, and they leave the room quickly, if not quite running. Once left behind, the feeling passes, and it's quickly forgotten or laughed off. What actually happens in these forgotten sanctuaries of the dark? It's impossible to tell. For while many such corners have been exposed to reveal absolutely nothing, some brave souls have lost their sanity through nothing more than an ill-timed glance. The safest thing to do when encountered with such a phenomenon, close your eyes, rip away the areas covering in a single motion, then keep a tight hold on whatever you've pulled away. No matter what you hear or feel, do not get up, do not look around, and do not try to cover your ears. You might be one of the lucky ones. There was this woman whose husband was acting very strange one day, very paranoid. She asked him why, and this is what he told her. Twelve years ago to this day, a whole bunch of my friends and I went to an old haunted house downtown to stay the night because we thought it would be fun. 
We were all settled on the bottom floor of the house, and we were fine for the first few hours. We began to hear things that sounded like footsteps pacing on the floor above us and scratching on the walls. We sent Jimmy, who was the oldest of us, up to have a look, so we grabbed his flashlight and we watched him head up the steps. His footsteps seemed to stop towards the last few steps where he was no longer visible to us, and slowly his light faded from view. We called after him, but there was no reply. Afterwards, we sent Matt, the second oldest, up to find him. He walked up the steps, and the same thing happened. At this point, we thought they were joking, and the third eldest, Jason, went up to look, shouting that he knew it was a trick and to give it up. At the last few steps, where the other guys had vanished, his shouting voice became distant before vanishing completely. The rest of us got scared and we went home to call the police, who checked it out the next morning and found blood smeared up sides of the walls and stairwells. They searched the entire house and never found a soul. The house was eventually knocked down and not one body was found. Every year on this day, one of us remaining from that house has disappeared, going from oldest to youngest. Her husband was not seen again after that day. Police held a brief investigation, but nothing came of it. I saw her out of the corner of my eye while I was studying in a remote corner of the second level stacks in the library. She was pretty with reddish hair and wide eyes in an intelligent face. I straightened up, patted my hair to make sure it was smooth and took another look. She was gone. I felt my shoulder sag a bit as I turned back to my books. Oh well, there were more important things, like studying hard, so that I got into medical school when I graduated next year. Still, I kept seeing the girl's pretty face whenever I closed my eyes, and I was still thinking about her as I left the library. A few of my friends shouted to me and I walked over to their gathering place. Where have you been, Tony? My friend Jeff called. At the library? I said, patting my backpack for emphasis. You've been studying? Jeff asked. I grinned. I gotta crack down now so I can get into med school, I replied. I can't always be partying with you losers. That set them off, as I had intended, and they kept the jokes flying until dinner time. Although I didn't admit to myself, I chose the same spot in the stacks for my studies the following afternoon, hoping to see the pretty girl again. I was in luck. After about an hour, she appeared among the shelves, browsing intently. I noticed that she was wearing the same flower dress with a button-down white sweater. She must like that outfit. It was time for me to do some browsing too, I thought. Straightening my shirt and rising casually, I turned to walk into the shelves and stopped abruptly. She was gone. I was astonished. She must be quick, I thought. It had only taken me a few seconds to rise and turn, but in that short time she had managed to move away without me seeing her do so. I walked casually through the stacks, glancing this way and that, trying to spot her again. No luck. With a sigh, I turned back to my seat and finished my studies. A frustrated man. I didn't see the girl again for several weeks. Then one day, as I rushed out of the stacks towards my friend Jeff, who was impatiently beckoning me to hurry up, I saw her rising from a seat in a far corner. I stopped abruptly and turned, hoping to catch her eye as she moved into the stacks. But she did not turn her head. Ignoring Jeff, who was calling my name impatiently, I backtracked into the hope of at least walking past her and saying hello. I stopped at the entrance of the stacks where the pretty girl with the reddish hair just walked. There was no one there. I shivered a bit. This was getting spooky. Was she avoiding me? Why? We'd never spoken and I certainly could not be accused of staring at her, since I'd only seen her for a total of maybe 30 seconds. Shaking my head at the mystery, 
I went back over to Jeff and exited the library. Later that week, I decided to skip the football game to go cram for a big exam. Just about everyone else was at the game, so the library was nearly deserted as I strolled over to my favorite study spot in the stacks on the second level. I'd given up on seeing the pretty girl with the reddish hair. Obviously, some things were just not meant to be. I was deep into my studies when I heard the sound of books and shelves tumbling to the floor. I leapt up and ran towards the sounds. To my horror, the pretty red-haired girl whom I had been trying to meet lay on the floor with books all around her. She was unconscious, and my heart gave a painful thump when I realized that there was blood staining her red dress. And then, right before my eyes, she vanished. I sat down abruptly on the floor, my leg shaking too hard to hold me. I had just seen a ghost. It was then that I remembered the story of the girl who'd been murdered in the library back in the 60s. I knew at once that had to be her. I had just seen the reenactment of her final moments of life. I buried my face in my shaking hands, feeling a terrible grief at the tragic loss of such a beautiful girl. From what I had heard, her murderer was never apprehended. It made me furious to think that justice had never been served. Slowly, I uncoiled my body and rose to my feet. The aisle between the stacks was empty now, and so was my heart. I was too unnerved to study anymore in this deserted place, so I grabbed my books and went back to my room. I saw the girl one more time before I graduated. I was reading at my favorite study cartel when I felt a chill in the air. I shivered and looked up. And there was the ghost of the pretty girl, standing a few feet away from me. Our eyes met and I saw fear and despair in her face. Immediately my own face twisted in sympathy and I impulsively held out my hand towards her. At the sight of my distress, she reached her hand back towards me as if to comfort me, and she gave me a tiny smile. Then she was gone. In that moment, I knew wherever the girl had gone after her death, she was just fine. And I felt sure that someday, somewhere, her killer would be brought to justice. If not in this world, then most assuredly, in the next. If you like what you heard, please like, subscribe, and share with your friends. If you'd like to, you can follow me at Twitter. The handle is at Fuzzy Pantaloons. And I'll see you all next time.